are such sinners, Lord. It's amazing, Lord, what you do for us, God. You make things beautiful for us, Father. And we can be still saved sinners and still be forgiven because of what you've done for us, God, and continue to do in our lives, Lord. I just pray that those who have a heart, a hearty heart, God, that they just let go of that hard heart, knowing that how much you love us, Lord, that you want us to love you, God. Fully be devoted to you, Lord, and to praise you and worship just like we did right now, God. That's my prayer tonight, Lord. It's just let go, God. Let us help us let go of whatever that pain, fear, hate, worry, whatever it is, Lord. Just let it go. Let it go to you and give it to you, Father. Because your promises are true, God. You won't forsake us, Lord. You love us. You have done so much for us, God. The ground we walk and air we breathe is yours, Father. This life is yours. We're just dust in the wind, Lord. You've given us so much. So, Lord, we just ask you to continue to bless us tonight as we get your word. As Pastor Ruben shared what you shared in him, Father. Again, my prayer, Lord, is just to, whatever those words you've given him, God, just help us be better. Help us change with them, God. Help us not to be hearers, but with us as doers of the word, God. We're thankful for for all you do. Let's all greet one another. It's on my desk. <laughs> my iPad on the desk. All right, let's if you have a bulletin, open it up. If you don't, Randy just took off with them all. <laughs> Let's see. First and foremost, the Women's Summer Bible Study. Virginia is really excited about it for this coming Thursday. It looks like there's a quite a few of you that will be joining her. She's been studying the last few days till late at night, getting prepared, so... And it's never too late. There's no material. So if you know somebody and you'd like to bring them, go ahead and bring them. And um, they can take care of the cost for the sign-up sheet. And I'm not sure what the cost is. She doesn't have, have what it is here. $10. Huh? $10. $10. Right. No, I mean, what was it for? I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason. Probably for the women's ministry. Oh, she does have booklets? Okay. I thought I asked her if she needs have any booklets to work from. She made them. Okay, maybe that's what it was. Okay, so ladies, Thursday at um, 6.30 p.m. to 9. I know you'll probably be a little later than that. <laughs> you all like to talk. <laughs> we'll be working on the um, church this coming Saturday from what I understand. So if you're Available, come join us Saturday morning to help us out. We're going to start working uh, probably in my office. So we're going to get some lights in, replace a door, and do little things like that. Oh, is it? Okay. So uh, if you're not doing anything, then come on out and, and join us. And then Saturday, for those of you that, that need food or like to help out with God's pantry, that will be this coming Saturday. <clears throat> Let's see, what else? I think that, oh, 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 virtual reality. Yeah. 
<clears throat> so we have plenty of plenty of space still. There's quite a few that signed up, but they haven't all paid. So I'm believing that they may not be coming or they're going to pay at that time. So uh, it's important that we all pay up and that um, we come because we guaranteed 50 people. And if only 25 show up, we have to pay for 50 people. So that's the agreement. <clears throat> if more show up, they have more of the equipment to actually add them on. So that's not an issue. It's just if we don't show up. So pray that everyone will show up and be excited and invite uh, uh, someone with along with you. And then from what I heard, it looks like all the youth can come for free. Uh, their um, fundraisers has covered the cost for the youth. It's 6.30, right? And it's at 6 o'clock here at the church. Uh, what I'd like to do um, is maybe maybe start at 5. I don't know if that's too early for some. And maybe have like a pot blessing. Just have people bring some stuff. And we always, either, either we're going to make tacos here, Manny is, or... <laughs> Or, or either we're going to be bring chicken and potato salad and that kind of stuff, country style. So uh, let's do that. Let's just bring chicken, potato salad, and a side dish, a drink, and maybe some dessert. Everyone just pitches in, and then we'll, we can eat, you know, an hour before and then take a break. And then maybe afterwards, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, getting some ice cream. We can have ice cream afterwards because it's only an hour long, so we will be done watching the movie probably right around 7.15 because it gives us a... 15 minute break or so I think in between I don't know why that is it might be because it messes your brain up while you're in there <laughs> and you become part of the matrix <laughs> I'm just kidding on that part <laughs> uh, all right let's have the, uh, the ushers come forward also the worship conference center guys uh, I believe today is the 14th so they extended the uh, the um, price for today, so you have till midnight today, it's still the $75.65. If not, it's going to be $100.75. So I hope you'll all come out, especially those of you in worship. It's so important that we, we fellowship um, in that type of atmosphere and in a conference. It just causes unity. It helps equip everyone. We're on the same page. We get the same teaching. And so when you know, we get back to church and, and things might change a little bit because the Lord ministers or, or a, a, you know, a teaching comes out of it and you're like, where did that come from? Well, if you would have been there, you would have known where it come from. So it's important that we, uh, we fellowship in various ministries and encourage one another. So I hope that you'll, you'll join us. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come before you now and we ask, Lord, that you would just bless the tithe and offerings. Lord, and those that uh, support this work and this ministry, Father, and, and Lord, the general funds, uh, Lord, that uh, are so needed, Father, just for the functioning of the church, Lord. Uh, definitely, Lord, we, we need funds for the youth, we need funds for the women, and, and so forth, Lord, but we need funds to keep this place open and running, Lord. And so, Father, I pray that um, you would continue to provide and lead and guide us, Father, as we go forward, Father, and bless us with your word, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's open up our Bibles to Numbers chapter 13. <clears throat> this evening we will be speaking about the promised land. The children of uh, Israel are there at the borders. And they will be asked to, or request to go into the promised land and spy it out. Now I had a prepared introduction here, but in light of what has happened recently, and some of you may not know this, I'm just going to share a little bit of what I know, and it's not a whole lot, because I'm not there, nor do I know the, the people, but we all know who Hillsong is, right? Yes. You know, the worship uh, group and... Uh, some people that are connected there that have been instrumental in changing the direction of, of worship and so forth and brought about some great, wonderful uh, songs of worship. Well, one of the guys, and I, I don't know his name, you'll have to do some research here on your, on your own so that you can you know, see that, that what I'm saying is, is true and only to the extent of what I know. So apparently he's been in this ministry Hillsong for quite a while and been leading people to faith, you know, and this whole thing has been growing as they've been trusting in God. 
uh, as a worship leader, teaching even doctrine to, to people and teaching them uh, spiritual things and so forth and causing a, a big movement to take place. And just recently he came out to say that uh, he's lost his faith, that uh, he no longer understands why God doesn't do any miracles anymore. He doesn't understand why um, pastors don't talk more about the contradictions in the Bible. He doesn't understand why um, people aren't on fire for the Lord anymore. And so he's lost his faith. And he came out publicly and, and said this. So it, the repercussions of this is going to be great. Because he's going by his feelings and his emotions and not by doctrine. Now I don't know about that church and what they teach at that church, but I can kind of guess, and we've been talking a lot about this lately, the great falling away, the great delusion, the, the weakness of the church and how it's teaching <clears throat> is on topical and we can know everything about marriage, but we don't know anything about doctrine. We don't know anything about the contradictions in the Bible. There are no contradictions in the Bible. And, and so um, I can see why he would say some of these things because he's not seen it in the group that he's involved in. Well, I've seen miracles. I've seen plenty of miracles in God moving in great ways in this church. And I've seen contradictions answered, whether it's been by um, um, Mitzler or Don Stewart or any of the books that I have in there that deal with these contradictions. We'll deal with one tonight <clears throat> and deal with them. Now, I think that, and this is just my opinion, I think that he had an agenda and it was an audience that he could reach and he can glean from greatly and then, you know, go his way as he, as he has done. So we see this great falling away, this lack of faith, this lack of trust in God, really a lack of relationship with God. And tonight we're going to see that with the children of Israel, exactly that, where they've seen all these miracles of God, but they're right at the border and they're going to lose faith. They're going to get weak. And in the daily bread that I was going to read, it said uh, in this reading, think about this just for a moment. Think of two balloons, and one is filled with carbon dioxide, which means it can't rise, and the other balloon is filled with helium, and immediately it rises, right? So too, if our hearts are filled with doubt and fear, we will not be able to rise in faith to do what God wants us to do. If we're filled with doubts and fear, now, we all have doubts and we all have fear. And depending upon your place in your walk will depend, will, will have the fruit of whether it's doubts or whether it's fear. If you're a young believer, I can understand that you're going to have doubts and fears because you're just learning to walk. Uh, you're experiencing God. And God is bringing you to a point where he's testing you and he's trying you and he's going to show you how faithful he is. If you're an older believer and been around for a while, those fears and those doubts should lessen because you've experienced God so much more. And just as I said before, and then I said in the past too, we've seen so many miracles here that I know God is going to do things. <clears throat> Even when it looks like nothing is going to be done and that we're you know, at maybe the, our end of the rope kind of thing, you know, and God all of a sudden pulls through. He always comes through. And I just know that because our God is faithful and because He is real. He exists. And I know that he exists. He is more alive than we are alive. And he has power and control over everything. And we must believe that. You must believe that if you're a Christian. If you call yourself a believer in Christ Jesus and you're born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus, you must believe that God is real and he can do anything. And that's when he works, when we have faith like Caleb and like Joshua who said, let's go in there because you promised us already that we would have that land before we even got there and we believe what you said and we're going to go in there and take Amen. it while the others said no we don't believe it they're too big you know and we can't fight and we're going to be in trouble so let's not go in there so we must have faith we cannot lose our faith and unfortunately this guy from Hillsong is going to bring a lot of people down with them the people that have doubts and have fears over these things so in this chapter, the Lord speaks to Moses after they leave Hazareth and settle in Paran's desert. And they are literally going to be at the border of Canaan as he orders some spies to go in and explore out the land. Three points tonight. The promised land, uh, which we're going to talk about from this point on, but this is the introduction to the promised land as they're at the border. We're going to see what's there in the promised land. 
what, what they are going to face within the promised land. But we're going to see that Jesus is our promised land today. And then the report that they bring back from the promised land and also the faith of Caleb and Joshua. So let's look at the promised land, verses 1 through 20. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the commandment of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. The Lord has spoken to Moses from the day of the burning bush, guiding him and Israel to the promised land. And he has been faithful all the way up from that point to this point to get them to the promised land, just like he promised he would. And that's not to say about what he did beforehand to get them to Mount Sinai from Egypt. And so God has been faithful. And everything that he has spoken to Moses, Moses has done. He has been faithful. And God has fulfilled everything that he said. So there is no reason to doubt God whatsoever. You can trust him as his word and you can trust him with his promises. And we can hold him to that because he promised that. Oftentimes when I'm going through something and I'm losing, you know, in a sense, weakening my faith a little bit and doubting, I just go right back to what I do know. <clears throat> Lord, you promised me. You called me. You've done, sometimes I look at this place and I go, you've done all this, what, to, to just, you know, resolve it, dissolve it, Lord? Is that what you've done? And I'm like, that's not you. So I know you're not going to do that. And so I oftentimes just go back and say, this is what you promised, and I know that you've promised it, so I'm going to believe that you will fulfill it. So there's no reason for Moses or the people to doubt or fear God. Now he says, send men to spy out the land of Canaan. Now Moses will tell us, who these men are in verses 14 through 16, and we'll just read their names rather quickly when we get there. But these men were on a re uh, reconnaissance mission uh, to observe the land of Canaan and bring back a report to Moses and the nation of Israel to encourage them, to strengthen their faith so they don't have doubts that God is going to give us the victory. And all of the spies chosen were leaders of each of the tribes of Israel, and they were sent to determine the best routes and the kind of people that they would encounter. Now, here's a, a contradiction. If you've studied your Bible and you've read through it, you probably uh, would have noticed this, but chances are you never noticed it uh, before. According to Deuteronomy, chapter 22, it says it a little differently than right here in Numbers chapter 1 and 2. I'm sorry, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Because <clears throat> here it says God told them to send the spies, right? And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Every one of you came near to me and said, Let us send, this is Moses speaking to the people, Let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up and of the cities into which we shall come. The plan to send spies did not directly originate from, with Moses, but came from the people, so it seems here. So Deuteronomy says that it was the people coming to Moses saying, let us go up. Here it says, God said, Moses, I want you to send some spies in there and go in. Furthermore, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 23, it says, the plan pleased me well. So this is Moses speaking. So I took 12 of your men, one man from each tribe. Moses said, the plan pleased me well. So Moses even agreed with the people that it was a good plan. And this plan had destructive results, didn't it? Now, it may very well be that Moses was wrong in taking this suggestion from the people. Perhaps uh, the accusation of Miriam and Aaron has kind of weakened him in trusting himself and making good decisions and raising up leadership, which does happen <laughs> because sometimes you don't always make the right decisions because man is sinful by nature and sometimes they are prideful and they get in the way and all of a sudden you start doubting yourself. That has happened in this ministry many times. In fact, people have suggested maybe you don't know how to lead. You know, and it's very devastating at times. And so Moses could be there and so now he's listening to the people. And it was a big mistake because the people were the ones that said we can't do it. We shouldn't go in there. But Caleb and Joshua said we can. Now, <clears throat> Here's a contradiction. 
and you obviously see it, right? Was it God who told Moses to do it, or was it the people who told Moses to do it, or was it Moses who said to do it? And so I did a lot of research here, and there were some theologians that talked about the actual Hebrew text itself that suggest that there's two accounts, two different times that they went in there. And so it could be that God directed them to go in, and then later on, the people directed Moses, let's go in there again, and let's um, spy out the land again. Now, that's a possibility there. It doesn't say that it's not, but it could be a possibility. Uh, it doesn't necessarily be, could it not necessarily be a, a, a contradiction because um, it has possible scenarios to it. For instance, if you go back to Genesis, and I'll give you an example of this, and you read the, the creation account, do you know that there's two creation accounts when you read it? There's the first account, which is very brief and clear. Then there's the second account, which is more detailed. When you read it, read it again. And basically what that is, is two different accounts. But, I mean, I'm sorry, the same account, but said two different ways. And that's all the text is doing. It's, it's like when we say, you know, I went to the store. And then you go, yeah, when I went to the store, I bought this, I bought that, I bought this. And you explain further what you did at the store. So it could be that this in this situation, it could be that God said... I want you to go in and spy out the land. And then there was some time. And then the people, as they were praying and seeking the Lord, they said, you know what, Moses, I think that we should go in and spy out the land. And then Moses agreed with them. And Moses said, it must be God telling us to go in. So that's a possibility. We see it with the calling of, of Moses, or of Joshua, when Moses was told he has to stay back. And God spoke to Joshua that you're going to lead these people. And so then... Joshua heard this, and then God told Moses, and then Moses told Joshua, so same scenario. And then later on, the people told Joshua that he would lead the people and they would follow him. So you have kind of a similar scenario there. So it's not a contradiction at all. It's not destroying the story and what had happened. It could be two different accounts, or it could be that they're all agreeing to do the same thing. And Moses was in the middle saying, yeah, God will do it. Yeah, people, we're going to do this. This is a good idea because God said it. You said it. And it kind of falls along what I've always said. Whenever you're praying, always get confirmation, right? Always get confirmation about your decisions that you're making. Uh, listen, uh, when I was, went to South Sudan uh, three years ago, it was a, the most scariest time of my first short mission journey, and I have to choose South Sudan when there's civil war going on. And so it was scary. My wife and I were, were really fearful about what would happen. In fact, we felt like that was going to be the end of me. I was literally going to give my life uh, as a sacrifice for the work of the Lord, and I didn't think I'd come back. And we even got scripture. She had written some scripture on the Bible where we were up at a, at a conference, and the scripture talked about God taking care of the church and God leading and guiding and, and leadership coming in. And I thought, man, this is so clear. And I thought that, um, that I was going to die. I was going to die. But I, I went anyway. But I got confirmation from it. And the Lord kept saying over and over, go, 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 go. And when I made it through, obviously I made it through because I'm, I'm here today. <laughs> when I made it through, the Lord said it was a testing. What you were going to die for was to self. Because you were going to learn to trust me in everything. Mm. And so I learned to die my, to myself and say, Lord, you are totally in control Amen. of our lives. And we need to believe that. And so... I think Moses is getting the confirmation here. Now, you can do some research, and I encourage you to do so, and, and find out maybe if there's some other scenarios that it could be, but I don't see it as a contradiction at all. Look at verse 3. <clears throat> so Moses sent from them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the commandment of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now, according to the commandment of the Lord, nevertheless, this was God's plan. God used the report of the spies as a test to test Israel's faith to see if they would trust in him. So he sends 12 leaders, uh, which he chose very carefully. Two men were selected from the tribes of, of uh, Judah, which is Caleb, and then Yeshua which, from Ephraim, which was Joshua. And then the others, look at verse 4 through 16. I'm going to try to pronounce these names, so bear with me. Now, these were the names from the tribe of Reuben. Shamuel, the son of Zakur, from the tribe of Simeon. Shaphat, the son of Horai, 
from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, from the son of Jephunai, from the tribe of Issachar, Egal, the son of Joshua, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, who is Joshua, the son of Nun. By the way, he's the only person born with no parents, the son of Nun. I tried that before, didn't work. From the tribe of Benjamin, Falti, the son of Refu, from the tribe of Zebulun, Gabadiel, the son of Sodai, from the tribe of Joseph, that is from the tribe of Manasseh, Gedai, the son of Shusai, or Shusai, from the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gimelai, from the tribe of Asher, Sedher, the son of Michael, from the tribe of Napula, Nathbai, the son of Bophesai, or Basi is another way of pronouncing it. From the tribe of Gad, Giru, the son of Malchai. These are the names of the men who Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hashua, the son of Nun, Joshua. And I agree with Moses completely. Guys, make your names easy. Uh, you know what? You got, Shua is just too hard. I'm calling you Joshua. And he should have done that with all the other guys, you know. There's there's John, and then there's Ted, and then, you know. <laughs> but Joshua was chosen as the leader. When you trace out the life of Joshua, it's pretty interesting how, how God begins to train this young man uh, to take over the tribe of Israel. He was right there by Moses, and he was so faithful to Moses. He was so faithful to the Lord to serve Moses in so many different ways. I really encourage you to, to trace that out from this point all the way until he takes over uh, uh, Moses' place as they go into the, the promised land. And that is right there in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. And he just takes over. And you see the type of men that God used. Men like Joshua, that first are faithful to God. He loved God with all of his heart. He trusted God. He had no fear of man. He knew who his God was. And so he gave his life to God completely. And he knew that God could raise up men that would lead them, that would be godly men, men that would hear the voice of God just as he heard the voice of God and that would lead them in a path of righteousness and would be faithful to fulfill what God has told them to do. And he knew Moses would do that. And even when Moses failed, Joshua was still there by his side because he also knew that mankind was sinful. We're all sinful and fall short of the glory of God. Even while we were yet still sinners, but yet Christ died for us. The Apostle Paul was still sinning when he said in Romans chapter 7, the things that I know I should be doing, I don't do. The things that I shouldn't do, I find myself doing it. And he struggled with that sinful nature and the spiritual man. And he said there were two different men. And you must feed the spiritual man to make him strong. But if you feed the fleshly man, then he'll become strong. But that fleshly man is with you until the day that you die. And so you have to ignore him. You have to murder him over and over and over again. The only kind of murder you can get away with. You just have to continually push him away. But he tries to, to get in, in, in your face. He tries to rule your life. But you've got to push him back and live the spiritual life. That takes faith and that takes, takes commitment and perseverance. We even see the, uh, Peter later on down the road that he sided with the Judaizers there in Galatians. And Paul had to correct him. So Joshua saw that Moses was also a sinner. But he was still committed to him because God called him to be his helper. To be his assistant. No matter what. And then God cast the baton to him to go into the promised land because of that. So an interesting young man. His name actually means salvation. It means Hoshua, that is Yahweh, is salvation. And Moses must have known that because um, Yahshua means I am salvation. And Joshua means Yahshua is salvation. So God says, no, you're not salvation, Joshua. God is salvation, Joshua. <laughs> so he changed it for him. And Joshua became his name, the name of the Messiah, who is our salvation. He was a type of Jesus, right? The type of Jesus that would come and deliver us through the promised land, the land of Canaan. Because the land of Canaan is a type of our walk in this world. It's not a type of heaven. Some people look at it and say, oh, finally we get to heaven. The children of Israel are in heaven. Well, when you read the stories, they're not in heaven. Nor are they victorious. They never do conquer the land, ever. Even to this day, they're still scattered, and many are still returning, recently even uh, returning to Israel today. No, it is a 
picture of the world that we walk in. And it is Jesus who helps us walk in it. He is our promised land because he keeps his promises for his people. Verse 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up into the mountains. Now, the south part of Canaan, which was the nearest part, and the worst too, being dry and desert, therefore fit for them to enter and pass through with less observation. You're spying out the land, so you have to figure out where am I going to go in where I'm not noticed. So into the mountain country and thence into the valleys, and so take surveys of the whole land. And they were to go by faith rather than by sight. That is so important. These 12 leaders of Israel were to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, what do I mean by that? Because they're going to see things that seem to be impossible, but they're to believe things by faith because of what God has said. God's told us, right, that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens us, right? He's, he's promised us that. So why do we walk by sight? Why do we look at situations and go, oh, I'm in trouble. God's left me. Maybe he doesn't love me anymore. Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe his promises aren't true. Maybe he's done with And we come up with all these scenarios instead of just saying, Lord, Lord, you said I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. So I know you're going to somehow give me victory over this, Lord. And so you have to walk by faith and not by sight. We're, we're not to walk by what we see. We're to walk by the word of God. See this guy from Hillsong? He was walking by what he saw. Oh, I don't see anybody correcting these errors in the Bible. Well, there are no errors in the Bible, first of all. Obviously, you're not reading your Bible. You're listening to someone else. Well, nobody's uh, performing miracles. Well, maybe not in your church, but there's plenty of miracles going on everywhere else. And we see that because we're walking by faith. But people who walk by faith only see the problems, only see the situations. Then they go by their feelings and their emotions. Whenever someone says, I feel, I go, up, oh, stop right there. That's the problem. That's the problem. You're feeling. Stop feeling and start trusting. Believe in God. I know you feel that way. Push that aside. Lord, I don't go by feelings. I go by faith. The challenge is while we're in the situation, in the midst of our struggle, that we're to walk by faith. That's the purpose of walking by faith. It's easy to walk by faith when nothing's going on and everything's you know, good. Oh yeah, I'm a man of faith. Wait till you go through something. Then you'll really see if you're a man of faith or a woman of faith at all. You have to go through things. And they were to walk by faith and not by sight. They are to walk by doctrine, what the Word of God says and not what they believe and what they think. One of the problems today, and I've noticed this with a lot of these worship leaders, is that they are trying to become the pastors of the churches now. They're the ones that are teaching doctrine and theological studies. They're setting the word instead of letting the pastor who does the study, the theological study and the discussions and the teachings, and instead of letting them do it. They're worship leaders. They are, get this, they are gifted to move people emotionally. Right? That's all. As they worship songs, as they're praising, it's all emotional. It has nothing to do. It should be based on doctrine, but it is emotional. You're preparing the heart to receive the word. And yet, we're not to live by those emotions. And just because we can come to a place and worship God and be very emotional doesn't mean that we know God. We have to know Him by faith and trust Him by faith. And so it's, it, it, it goes beyond our feelings and our emotions. And you get somebody like this who is trained to move people emotionally, living their life emotionally. And they shouldn't be living emotionally. They should be living by the Word of God. Emotions are good in its proper place, but it's not good when it's misleading you and it's causing you to have a lack of faith. So they traveled like 250 miles for 40 days and then returned and brought back grapes, pomegranates, uh, figs that were huge, uh, that were a blessing to the land. And verse 18 says, See what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many. So check it out. Check out everything. Spy out everything. See what the people are like. Uh, see how they react. See how they act. See what they're doing. See how the land is. See if there's plenty to go. Now, Big grapes doesn't necessarily mean like they're um, 
humongous, you know, somebody's messed around with the DNA and made these super grapes. No, it just means abundant of grapes. And they probably had a lot of grapes, and so they had to carry them on these uh, poles and so forth. Verse 19, whether the land will dwell, whether they will dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like uh, camps or strongholds. Now, some have suggested that because they're doing this reveals a lack of faith. Who cares? Who cares? God's already said you've got the land. He's already divided it up. So who cares? Or this could be a strategic thing. God has given you the land, but you have to do your part. You're going to have to battle. You're going to have to fight. Now, there's going to be times when God does a miracle and he fights for you. You know, like the 185,000, you know, and the angels were there, you know, to do the battle. Or, or, or when two guys go down into the camp and confuse them, those type of things. God performs miracles, but we still have to fight. David fought. He was a man of blood. His hands were bloody hands, and that's why he couldn't build the temple. So it could be that God is saying, go down there so that you can see what you're fighting against and gain strength that when I give you the victory, you will be able to trust me even more than you have. Whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was, this, and was the season of the first ripe grapes. So it was rich, it was fertile there. Let me give you some application. When God directs us to do something, we need to believe by faith that he will provide. We have to believe that. Walking by faith can be scary, but we must believe that God is going to give us the victory. Must. Jesus is the perfect example of that. He walked by faith. He knew what the Father said. You have to go to the cross. Even though he struggled with it at the garden, Lord, if this cup that you gave me, if there's any way you can remove it, but not my will, your will be done. I'm going to trust in you. And if I have to, I will go. Though I'm stressing and it's difficult, I'm still going to trust in you. I'm going to walk by faith. Our lives in this world as families should be one of faith. You know, they say that you're one paycheck away from losing everything. And the more that I see it, I agree with it. And they've been saying that ever since I was a young man and started working, that we're all one paycheck away from being broke. And we see it here, don't we? In this community, the homeless, people without jobs, or they have jobs and they're barely making it here. But what's interesting is they're making it. And God somehow has a way of being faithful through it all. Thank you, Jesus. When I left Southern California Edison, I left a $110,000 a year job to come full-time for about $24,000. And that took a step of faith. I had to trust that God was going to provide for my wife and I. And 25 years later, I'm still here. And sometimes I, I think, are you going to still provide for us? But... I've been doing it for 25 years. I'm not going to stop you know, until the day that you go home. He's going to be faithful. So we, we have to believe what he says. And if he said it in his word, we have to believe it more than ever before. Because he promised to provide for us. David said, I've never seen the children go without. Ever. You know, and I've seen the same thing. I've seen some homeless people. But they have cars. They have phones. They are able to get showers. You know, they get food. They're making it. They're making it. Oh, but how terrible to live in a car. We'll go back, you know, into some of these countries. They're in tents. You go to Africa, they're in little shacks. And I'm talking a shack that is about the size of a tent, and it's made out of hay. <clears throat> and they have their little solar panel up there so they can watch TV. And they have their cell phones. And they live out of that. That's, that's most of Africa. They're at least in South Sudan. Of course, there's cities, and there's people in houses, and there's... Uh, universities and college people, but normally out in the boonies areas, they're all living in little shacks. You know, so that's common over there. So a car, you're doing a lot better than a shack. A so, uh, solar panels, they, they have, you know, I mean, our poor are pretty well off compared to a lot of other countries. And God is faithful. So we must believe by faith that he will provide for us or get us through whatever it is. 
And I really believe it is our faith that God moves upon. And he tells us that in the parables in Luke, right? Quite often, look, if you want something, ask, seek, knock, and my Father in heaven will give it to you. So be like the, the woman that goes to the judge and keeps pestering, 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 and finally just says, fine, I'll give you your verdict, you know? And so we have to pray and pray and pray until God says, okay. So we must have faith while we're in the promised land. Second point, the report. Verse 21 through 30. So they went up, spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Ahiman, Shishiah, and Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. Now, Hebron was built seven years before Zoran in Egypt. So he's giving us some geographical areas here, where they were to go up and what they were going to see. He's going to mention quite a few uh, groups of people and tribes that they're going to be dealing with as they're in the promised land. People that will be a thorn in their side to a certain degree. Just like we have today, people that are thorn in our side that are challenging us continually like the, the um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, constant attack on Christianity. They could be the Annex or the Amalekites or the Parasites, you know? They could be uh, other groups out there like the atheist groups and other groups that always are against God's people. Or it could be the so-called Christian churches that are against those conservative Christians. So he says, then they came to the valley of Eshkol and there cut down a branch from one cluster of grapes, they carried it between two of them on a pole. And they also brought some of the pomegranates and the figs. The place was called the Valley of Shishkol because of the cluster, that is of the grapes, which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now this reconnaissance mission took them 40 days. Moses said, take 40 days go down there. So they literally had to dwell among them, right? Uh, they, they lived among them to a certain degree, were probably out in the, de in the deserts, in the forests, who knows, or they could have been among them to spy out the land, but they were among them for 40 days. That's enough time. That's one month and almost uh, a week, right? To be there. Now it's interesting because the uh, number 40, and you've probably heard this before, the number 40 is significant, and when God tests his people, he often uses a period of 40 days, such as 40 days or 40 years. Uh, this one site that I oftentimes go to to get some information, they did a, a quick uh, reference for 40 days, so I wanted to read it for you. It's called Got Questions. It's a good little site if you ever want to go to it, and you just ask it questions, and it comes up with some really good conservatives, and it's run by a Calvary Chapel um, person. He says the number 40 shows up often in the Bible because 40 appears to uh, appears so often in context dealing with judgment or testing. And many scholars understand it to be the number of probation or trials. This doesn't mean that 40 is entirely symbolic. It still has a literal meaning in Scripture like 40 days, meaning 40 days. But it does seem that God has chosen this number to help emphasize times of trouble and hardship. Hardships, And let me give you some examples uh, in the Bible that uses 40 as a theme of testing and judgment. In the Old Testament, when God destroyed the earth with water, he caused it to rain 40 days and 40 nights. After Moses killed the Egyptian, he fled to Midian, where he spent 40 years in the desert tending flocks, which is the time for him to be tested and tried. That's where he learned to trust in God and have faith in God. Moses from Mount Sinai uh, was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, which was a testing for the children of Israel, right? Because where's Moses? Uh oh, he's gone. Let us create gods. And they failed that test. Uh, Moses interceded on Israel's behalf for 40 days and 40 nights. We see in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 18 and 25. The law specified a minimum number of lashes a man could receive for a crime, setting the limit at 40 lashes. Again, judgment. In the Old Testament, when God destroyed the earth with water, he caused it to rain 40 days and 40 nights. After Moses killed the Egyptians... Oh, I already read that. I'm sorry. I didn't turn the page. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness 
after saying they couldn't go in and conquer it for 40 days. And before Samson delivered Israel, and ser uh, uh, Israel who served the Philistines for 40 years. Goliath taunted Saul's army for 40 days before David arrived and slayed him. Elijah fled from Jezebel, uh, and he traveled 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb. The Israelite spies took 40 days to spy out the land of Canaan. So the number 40 appears in the prophecies of Ezekiel and Jonah. In the New Testament, Jesus was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. There were 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and the ascension when he walked among the believers. And whether or not the number 40 really has any significance, it's still a debate. I think we need to be careful that we don't get into this numerology study and start creating things that aren't really there. And, and this happened in the late 90s and 2000s when people got into numerologies, started counting numbers, and every word, every 40th word was a, a word, and they would start putting sentences, and, and they came up with things like they predicted Hitler taking over and then being destroyed, and all of these things. We have to be careful because it's very subjective. And I've never, I've never really cared for that kind of stuff because I'm more of a logical person. I think logically, I see, and then I am moved by what I see and not by my feelings. Though I, don't, I have feelings and I can be moved by it, but I try not to be. And those numbers and numerology can move you in ways that you really don't know. Then they, they came up with a computer that would count certain names and see if there were algorithms within the scriptures and come up with all kinds of things. But that has died to the wayside eventually. I found that most of these things that come up as new revelations or, or new doctrines, they're just old doctrines regurgitated in different ways. And if you give it enough time, they'll be proven to be wrong. And we have to be very patient. And that's why I agree with Pastor Chuck. Just stick with what you know. Just go through the Bible. Just teaching what the Bible teaches and you will be safe on every count. Can't be moved by, again, sight. We have to be moved by faith. So after 40 days, verse 26, they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And it is, and it's fruit. Now, he's not saying literally a lot of milk was there. What he's saying was there are a lot of animals that give milk. There's enough to provide for them. And also, the honey is not necessarily um, honey, but honey and sweetness. There's enough there to provide for them, again, agriculturally. But not necessarily, there's just an abundance of honey itself. It's a way of saying there's an abundance of everything to take care of all of their needs. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of the Anakes there. So again, um, as they looked at this by sight, it began to bring fear into their heart and doubt that they could have victory over the situation. Verse 29, the Amalekites dwelled in the land of the south, the Hittites and Jebusites and the Amorites dwelled in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwelled by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are all well able to overtake it. So what the people were doing was, look, they're giants. Yes, there's plenty of food there. But that only means they're strong and they're able to beat us. And they're up on the mountains and they're by the beach and they're around us and they will overtake us. And so Caleb is listening to this and says, stop, shut up, everybody. Let's just go in there and let's overtake them like God said we would. That was his heart. And along with, with Joshua there. Again, they brought fear among the people. And that can happen, right? That can happen. I've seen it happen. Where one man, one woman, can bring doubt and fear within the church and cause it to spread among others. Oh, something's wrong. Something's not done right. And they begin to gossip and tail bear and say these things. And now some doubt begins to arise. And then you have this little group that's over there saying, no, this isn't God's work. It's not happening. It's not going the way I think it should go. 
you know, let's, let, let's just do something. You need to leave or you're not called of God. I don't know what, you know, I have found, and I'll just tell you the truth. I have found whenever someone does something like that, the ultimate end is to kill you because hatred kills, right? The Bible is very clear. You shouldn't hate your brother because hatred is murder. <clears throat> hatred is murder. And, and when you are trying to divide the body, your intent is to kill. You were, and if you lived in a time and age where you could, well, you'd probably kill me <laughs> or kill leadership or kill the people that you don't like. And that's the ultimate end in anything. I've seen it in families. When families get mad at other family members, you know, and they start talking and, and they're bitter, and, and basically they're murdering them, and they're murdering their character, and they're slandering them, and no longer can anyone fellowship with them or, or view them as someone that's a part of the family because they've been slandered so badly. And you might as well have murdered them. And that's really the intent of our heart. It's that formulation to the ultimate end because sin brings what? Death. death. It brings death. And we don't think about that. And that's why it's important, guys, that <clears throat> when we're serving the Lord, when you're involved in the ministry, that you stay as positive as you can. If you see something that maybe you don't agree with, that's okay. It's just a different model. He does differently, and that's okay. You do things differently, too. Let him play his role. He has a role. You have a role. And things will function more Easily, like I said earlier, Joshua let Moses play. He was in charge. Let's do it, John. Let's do it, Moses. Let's do it together. I'm backing you 100%, even if we disagree. It's the best thing to do. It is good and healthy for the body of Christ. It's good for our families that we're all on the same page. If your husband is not leading the way that you think he should be leading, support him, love him, encourage him, pray for him, but don't divide him. That's where divorce happens. That's where fights happen. And that's where children then get confused and they don't see the unity within the family itself. And that's why it's so important that women submit to their husbands as hard as that is, but it keeps the unity within their family unit. And it doesn't give um, bad information to the children that confuses them later on down the road. So... <clears throat> The difference of opinion here. One says, let's go in. The other says, no, let's not go in. And so they have to have faith. And they didn't have the faith. But Joshua and Caleb do. Third point. The report that brought the fear that spread among the Israelites. They had forgotten that the Almighty God had already said that I've delivered this land over to you. It's already yours. You are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. Look at verse 31. But the man... <clears throat> but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land uh, through which we have gone as spies in a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great statues, or they're great warriors, they're great warriors. Notice they were talking to the people. They were spreading this out, bringing fear and division among the body of Christ. So they're great giants. Who cares? Our God is the one who created them. <laughs> Our God is the one who created And with just a word, they would be gone. I think of uh, the story of Goliath, right? Who mocked Israel for 40 days, right? And there's Saul. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so Saul is thinking of putting on his armor, but he's saying, no, I better not. He's got the fear. He's the king. And what happens? David comes along. And he says, why are you guys wasting your time with this uncircumcised lesson? Now, what, are you, what are you guys doing? And so Saul says, well, I want you to go out there and find him. And they bring Saul's armor to put on David. He says, David, get that off me. I don't need that. I don't need someone's armor. I serve the most high God. And he grabs a stone, you know, Actually, uh, three other stones, too, because of his brothers that were there. And he figured out to take them all out. <laughs> so, and so he goes up to him, and, and he swings that stone, and boom, there goes a giant. A little boy who was used to fighting off bears and lions because they attacked the, the sheep with stones. And so he became a marksman. And boom, hit him right between the eyes. 
and then grabbed the sword and whoosh, whacked off his head. So what is a giant to a little boy? Nothing when God is on your side. Amen. Now you think, that's just a story. And I've heard it over and over again. But it's a true story. And it's a true story. It really happened in the life of David. And this is what gave David the strength and the power to believe God. That he became a man after God's own heart. That even when he sinned, and he sinned greatly, murder, adultery. But yet he was still known as a man after God's own heart. He suffered for that sin. But he was a man that believed who God was and knew that God would be faithful. And he served God with all of his heart. But he also served his flesh. If God could do that with a little boy, he can do it for us, guys. But we must have faith in God. So he closes with, There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now notice that. We were like grasshoppers in our sight. And so we were in their sight. In other words, they saw the fear in them, right? Now, if you're in a fight, what is the first thing you're going to look for? Fear in a person. And if that person is fearful, you want to fight. Because you know they're not going to be able to really defend themselves. And they're not going to be aggressive. And they're not going to know what to do. And so because of your confidence, you've already overcome the enemy that quickly. So fear does a lot in our battles. Let me close with this. <clears throat> we can say with confidence that Jesus is our promised land today. As Christians, he has promised us so much and we can believe in those promises. Our life, our, our source of life comes from Jesus alone. That's why we exist because of what he has done upon that cross, giving us eternal life. The only one who has all authority and power uh, to fulfill his promises is Jesus. And very clearly in 2 Corinthians 1.20 he says, for as many as are the promises of God in Christ, they are yes. Or in other words, they're all answered yes. So through him, we say amen to the glory of God. When God makes a promise, they're all yes. They will happen. They will be fulfilled because he promised it. Our goal is not to gain material wealth, houses, cars, books, shows, uh, jobs, schools, anything else uh, that God wants for us. Our destination is Jesus. And when we plant our feet firmly in the promised land of Christ, all of those other things are added to us. We keep him in the center of our life. We keep, them, he, we keep him there and he has all those things unto us. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first and most importantly, seek the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's a promise, guys. If we seek him first, that's not seek our job first. It's not seek our wealth first. It's not seek other things first. It's seek him first. And he promises that everything else will be given to us, whatever we need. That's a promise and we need to believe that. 110%. There should be no doubt there. So he encourages us to run right into the arms of Jesus, right? And in any situation, you, Lord Jesus, I need your help here. I need you to build my faith. I need to give, give me strength to get through this. Help me to see by faith and not by sight that you are more than able, Lord. Everything you could ever want is found right there in, the, in, in his heart. All of the promises of God are fulfilled as you let him embrace you, lead you, and guide you. The beat of his heart is thumping for you, and it is unleashing every good thing, every good gift from above that falls from the Father of lights, because he is our promised land. So we can trust Jesus completely as we are walking in our land of Canaan. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I know how easy it is to read these truths and to agree with them, Lord. But, Lord, to live it out as we suffer through our own trials and our own dilemmas, Lord, can be very hard, Lord. Because we, at the moment, can only see the water rising. 
the fire burning and us drowning and being consumed, Lord. Help us, Father. Help us, Lord. Show us over and over again, Lord, that you are faithful. Even when we're not faithful, Lord. There have been many miracles in the Gospels where we see that it wasn't someone's faith. Sometimes it was someone else's faith that caused him to be healed. And sometimes it was just God showing the world that he had authority over sin. And so, Lord, we need to believe and trust you, Father. Help our simple faith, Father, to be strong, that we may put it in you and completely believe that you will take care of us, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Pray the Lord will bless you. And by the way, when you leave, you may not have noticed but we have a quote out there as you're leaving the doors, look up, and it's a quote by Pastor Chuck that would oftentimes quote it after a Sunday it's a message there. So read it every time you go up, and remember that the, the Lord wants to bless you abundantly. God bless you. Have a wonderful night.